There are lots of different ways of getting the mind to settle down. And the breath is the object the Buddha discussed most frequently and in most detail. But there are other ways of getting the mind to settle down as well. You can focus on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, either by simply repeating one of those words in your mind as you breathe in, breathe out, or you can focus on their qualities. Think about the Buddha, think about the Dharma and the Sangha, what you find inspiring. You can think about your generosity, you can think about your virtue. The times when you were generous, you didn't have to be. There was no compulsion, but you just simply wanted to share. It's good to think about those times. The same with times when it was difficult to hold by your precepts, but you did. You can think about the Brahma Viharas. You can think about death. that it could come at any time. That contemplation is not meant to be a sole topic of meditation, though. The way the Buddha recommends it is that you think about the fact that death could come at any time. So you've got work to do. What work do you need to do? What things do you need to let go of in the mind that would hold you down, pull you back? Some people have very personal ways of getting the mind to settle down. There's a story in the canon of a nun who was frustrated by the fact that she couldn't get her mind to settle down at all. She reflected on the fact that people who work hard in the fields had to work a lot harder than she did, and yet they were able to do it. Why couldn't she get her mind to settle down? So she walked back to her hut, and as she was washing her feet, before going into the hut. She just focused on the water, and as it flowed down, it calmed her mind. She entered the hut and actually gained awakening. There's a story in the commentary of a monk who was so inarticulate that he couldn't even keep one meditation word in his mind. So the Buddha gave him a piece of cloth and said, just rub your hand over this piece of cloth again and again. As he did, he began to notice that the sweat on his hand was discoloring the cloth. That gave rise to a sense of sangwega, and that calmed his mind down. So you choose the topic that you want to get the mind still. The breath has lots of advantages. Some of those other methods can be used only for a certain amount of time. That's contemplation of the body. It would be great for developing some wake, but sometimes it gets depressing. You find that you can't even eat, which is not the purpose of the meditation. In cases like that, the Buddha says, go back to the breath. He says it's like a rainstorm that comes in at the beginning of the rainy season in India, washes all the dust out of the air. So working with the breath cleans unskillful qualities out of the mind. So the technique for getting the mind still is going to be an individual matter. What's important is so you do get the mind to settle down clearly here in the present moment, because you need to see a lot of things, and not just see, not just observe. You're going to be passing judgment. We hear so much about how mindfulness is a ju non-judgmental, non-reactive state of mind. And the Buddha, as he taught meditation to Rahula, his son, it started out with, with saying, make your mind like earth. Earth doesn't react when disgusting things are thrown on it. 
doesn't get excited when you pour perfume on it. But that's just the beginning. You want to get your mind still and solid like that. And then the Buddha taught the steps for breath meditation, which are very proactive. And you are passing judgment. What kind of breathing feels good? What kind of breathing doesn't feel good? And you train yourself to develop breathing that gives rise to a sense of refreshment, gives rise to a sense of pleasure. If the mind is scattered, you learn to breathe in ways and think in ways that get it to settle down, be more concentrated. If it's feeling low, you try to find ways of making it more glad. You don't just sit with whatever. If the mind is low, you try to gladden it. If it's scattered, you try to concentrate it. If it's feeling burdened by something, you try to release it. The reason the Buddha has you make your mind or your basic attitude more solid is so that you can notice what's happening in the mind, step back from it, and figure out what really needs to be done. So there's a judgment involved. As he said, once you've learned the Dharma, you've thought it through, it makes sense. You give rise to a willingness and desire to practice. And then you judge what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your behavior, against the standards of the Dharma. And the teachings themselves, as a whole, one judgment after another. The Buddha started his first sermon in two ways of practicing that are not noble. Indulgence in sensuality and self-torture. There are two paths. There's the noble path and the ignoble path, and there are lots of ignoble paths, actually. But the noble path is what looks for something deathless. That's the basic value that underlies everything in the practice, that a happiness that is deathless, a happiness that is totally harmless, happiness that is not subject to change, is possible through your actions. And so you judge everything else you do and say and think against that possibility. So as you sit here and meditate, if the mind is not settled down, you ask yourself, what could settle it down? Choose a topic that you like. Or think things through. What is getting in the way of it settling down? The Buddha says there are basically two types of causes of suffering. One type is the one where all you have to do is look at it and it goes away. The reason it has power over the mind is that you're not looking at it. You don't see it. But if you can get the mind to be a little bit still, look at itself, you realize this is dumb. Whatever underlies this particular cause of suffering is something I don't really believe in, actually. Why do I let myself be overcome by it? It's this kind of cause of suffering that the technique of just watching or being with something can overcome. But there are other kinds of causes of suffering that don't go away when you just look at them. And you've got to have that sense of value behind what you're going to do, that this type of cause should not be allowed to stay. What can I do to get rid of it? What can I do to abandon it? The Buddha says you exert a fabrication against that cause of suffering. The fabrication here can mean your bodily fabrication, in other words, the breath. Say anxiety arises, and you find yourself breathing in a certain way. Well, learn how to breathe in another way that's not so aggravating to the anxiety. Then there's verbal fabrication. How are you talking to yourself about it? What are you saying? You're talking about something that you're afraid is going to be taken away from you. 
Is that a fear that you want to give into? Do you want to hold on to something that's going to expose you to that kind of fear? This is where the Buddhist values differ from the values of the world. The world says you've got to hold on. You've got wealth, you've got family, you've got your loved ones. Without them your life is meaningless, so you've got to do everything you can to protect them. And the Buddha says that, that kind of loss is not really all that important. He takes a much larger view. Imagine someone who's seen aeons and aeons of past lifetimes, seeing the whole universe full of beings dying and being reborn based on their karma. And from that perspective, he said, you lose your relatives, you're going to get them back. You lose your wealth, you're going to get it back again and again and again. You're going to lose it again and again. That kind of loss doesn't necessarily pull you down. The kind of loss that pulls you down is if you lose right view and if you lose your virtue. If there's anything to be afraid of, be afraid of that. It's a different kind of fear, the fear that comes from losing things in life, in terms of the people, in terms of things, status, whatever. It comes from a sense of powerlessness. Fear of losing your virtue, fear of losing your right view. It's a fear that comes from a sense of power. You have the power to protect these things. No one else can destroy your virtue. No one else can take away your right views. You're the one who can destroy them. You're the one who can take them away. You have the power to protect them, you don't want to, or to drop them, and you don't want to abuse that power. In other words, you think about these things, that's verbal fabrication. And you see that the fears that are making you anxious are not things that you really want to focus on, not things you want to have take over your mind. Then there's mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings, what images you hold in mind, your sense of values. This means that, that means this, this is worthwhile, that is not worthwhile. Sometimes you actually see a visual image in the mind of you being deprived of something, or of you being threatened by something. And you can change that image. Remind yourself that you have a certain kind of power. The things of the world, I like what John Cha says, he picked up a cup one time, he said, this cup is already broken. In other words, you know, someday it's going to be broken. So you have to look at it from that attitude. In the meantime, you take good care of it. You don't mistreat it. You take good care of it, but knowing that someday it's going to be broken so that when it does break, you're not surprised. You're not caught off guard. That's a perception you can hold in mind. So these perceptions, these ways of thinking, even these ways of breathing, are based on a set of values. That a deathless happiness is possible. It's the best thing you can go for. And then you rank all your other values in line with that. So meditation is not just a technique. There's not just one insight technique that works, and not just one concentration technique that works. The commentaries count forty, and they're actually more than that. What unifies everything is the sense of values. See, when I keep those values in the back of your mind, as you meditate, as you get up, as you engage in the rest of your activities, 
learn to look at the, the world from the point of view of the, the Buddha's awakening. In Buddhism, that's the event. That puts everything else into perspective. What the Buddha saw on that night, what he was able to accomplish on that night, gives us a sense of the world we live in and the possibilities for happiness that are open to us all. Those are the things that determine our values. So we can find a happiness that really does satisfy, causes no harm to anyone, and will never leave us. <laughs>